و x is in short and equal. 179. So it seems to be a pretty good crowd. Seems like it's time to get going. Um, I just posted into um, the Jabber uh, the link directly. I see some people are having trouble with some of the media materials, um, getting them downloaded successfully. Um, I don't know what the problem is. Uh, I do know the individual uh, slide material is directly available under the ADD group web page in Data Tracker under meetings and then the media materials for this ITF 107. So you can directly download them there, uh, or you can just watch your screens and play along at home. So welcome to the first meeting for ADD. A um, uh, couple points. Uh, this session is recorded. Uh, please make sure your video is turned off at home. Uh, mute your microphone unless you are speaking. If you want to join the queue for um, comments, please put a plus Q. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm getting a message from somebody. Um, please put a plus Q into the WebEx chat session. If you want to get out of the queue for speaking, when we open the lines, put a minus Q uh, and we'll keep track of that and call you when it's your turn. Uh, as well, please do not use the uh, WebEx chat session for conversations to the whole group. Uh, for that, either use Jabber or use direct uh, messaging between people. We're going to try to keep the main chat session in uh, WebEx. Uh, for managing the queue. So um, up there on the screen as well, we have the pointer to Jabber and to the Etherpad. Uh, Barbara Stark has volunteered to uh, be um, uh, a scribe uh, in Etherpad. If there's somebody else who would like to join her and help her out, because these ADD sessions in the past have gotten pretty busy and quick, um, is there somebody who'd be willing to help Barbara out uh, in the Jabber? Okay, I see one person in or I see one person in Jabber commenting. So, they, uh, so okay, so we got got some some people in Jabber. We got some people in Etherpad. Um, I think we are set to go. Um, for those who haven't read the instructions for the remote participants. Uh, the way we're doing blue sheets is for people to go into the uh, Etherpad. And at the bottom of the Etherpad, you'll find a list of names and affiliations. Go ahead and add yours to that list, please. Okay. So moving on. And bear with me. First time we've done this. Uh, as this is a is an ITF meeting, albeit our first virtual one, uh, please note that NoteWell does apply. And please be familiar with all the, the requirements of participating in an ITF meeting. And welcome to ITF 107, ADD Virtual Working Group. We're going to go for the next two hours and talk about the wonderful world of discovery and conveyance of information about resolvers to clients. This is our agenda. Um, David Lawrence and myself are your chairs. Uh, we'll have an agenda bash, uh, followed by, uh, uh, I believe Ted Hardy is gonna speak to the draft he and Yari have put together, uh, talking about resolver, distributed resolver selection. Uh, then Tommy Pauly will speak on discovery selection directions. Uh, Dan Wing will present uh, two different uh, working uh, uh, drafts. Uh, then Daniel McGill will, uh, be our last one, and then we'll have uh, hopefully have 15 minutes left over for some Q&As. So since we can't see each other, I thought you might like to see who's who to blame. Uh, <laughs> there's myself and there's David. Uh, and there are the links to the Etherpad and to the Jabber. I'll give everybody a minute if they want to grab that. They're also going to be on the other slides. So any comments, any uh, things that people would like to uh, alter, change uh, on the agenda? Speak up uh, uh, by adding your plus sign to the queue or comment in, in, into um, the chat please. Okay. Hearing none. 
Um, let's move on. So uh, welcome to ADD. Uh, this has been a long time coming. Uh, we've had a couple of boss that touched around the topics of um, where ADD event ended up. Uh, this started out as, as sort of a, uh, a very DOE-centric uh, discussion. It's evolved, uh, I think, to cover a, a sort of more generic discovery of uh, encrypted um, DNS provided resolvers, whether they be DOT or DOE. So we're not DOE-centric, we're, we're equal opportunity. Uh, the, the charter as it got developed over the last, uh, few months, uh, went through a lot of changes. And so I invite everybody to become familiar with where it ended up. It's a very narrowly scoped, uh, charter. Uh, we're specifically focused on, uh, the questions of how do you discover, uh, resolvers and, uh, also to charter to develop a mechanism for resolvers to convey. Uh, information back to the client such that the client can use that information to make decisions on where to um, uh, which resolver to pick. We're not here to talk about policy. We're not here to talk about uh, UI interfaces in the clients, all the other kind of stuff is out of scope. We're really limited to the technical nuts and bolts of discovery and conveyance of the information. The rest of it's left up out of, to somebody else at the moment. So with that said, Dave, do you want to make any comments? Uh, just, yeah, quickly, uh, you already covered a little bit of how we're managing the queue. I wanted to add the additional note that we'll save questions for the end of presentations and not really be able to do an interrupt queue. And um, when you request in WebEx chat to be added to the queue, if your handle does not reflect your full name, could you please include your name in your queue request? Thank you. Thanks, Dave. And Barry, did you want to say anything? No, I think uh, I think you've done well. Just just carry on. Okay, thank you, Barry. All right, well, let's get to it then. Uh, so, Ted, I, I have not seen you on the system, but I haven't checked yet. Are you around? I am here. Um, okay, I'll bring up your presentation then. There is a missing picture there. This is also work that Martin Thompson contributed to. Um, so, if you haven't seen Martin Thompson recently, he can send around a picture on his own, I guess. Um, okay, Ted, so just let me know when you want the next slide hit and I will do it. Okay, uh, as, a, uh, as the agenda noted, uh, this is based off a draft that Yarnarko, uh, Martin, and I have been working on. Uh, next slide. One second. And so this is the key question we're trying to ask here uh, is, can you reduce the concentration of information about client activity by distributing across different resolver services? And the reason we're talking to you about it, uh, even though it's not strictly about conveyance, is it goes to the question of how many of these might you uh, collect if you are uh, a client that is looking for DNS services or trying to gather information about DNS services. Uh, clearly, if you need to collect in order to uh, accomplish a particular strategy more than one, uh, knowing that and knowing why you might use more than one uh, DNS uh, resolver uh, is important. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is what we believe is uh, a set of common DNS resolver selection patterns. Uh, the first one is there's a single configured resolver and all queries go to that. Uh, the second is there is a resolver used for all the local interfaces, but a separate resolver uh, configured for uh, VPN interfaces. And the last is that there are per interface uh, DNS resolver lists. Uh, it's our intuition uh, that these are kind of roughly ranked in terms of com common app, but I'm afraid we don't have any data to share uh, that would either demonstrate that or tell you what the approximate numbers are for each one. That's just kind of our rough understanding. Uh, next slide. And this is sort of what happens uh, when you have this set of uh, configured resolver, uh, what the query patterns look like. Uh, so in the first case, uh, there's one configured resolver, so that resolver knows everything about the client's query traffic, but no one else does. And that's an important thing that didn't quite fit on the slide. Uh, in the second case, uh, there's a resolver used for all local network interfaces, but a separate resolver configured for VPN interfaces. In this case, the common resolver gets all the query traffic except for the VPN, and the VPN gets all the uh, 
traffic pass through the tunnel. Um, in the per interface DN DNS resolver list, it does exactly what it says in the team. Ten, each resolver gets queries only for the traffic on that interface. And if you said split DNS for item two and cell phone for uh, uh, your breath for item three, collect a cookie. Actually, make that two or three cookies in the common case. And uh, next slide, please. So, what are the privacy implications of these common approaches? Uh, well, one thing that's fairly obvious is that if multiple uh, ones of these resolvers configured, sent all of a specific client's queries to all of the resolvers available to it, then all of them would know thing about all of their resolution events. Uh, that clearly is not going to be the best way to reduce the information um, being leaked out into the world about the client. Uh, there are a few clients that actually do this, uh, primarily ones which have no bandwidth constraints and very requirements, uh, but it's not really uh, a very privacy focused um, uh, view of how to do this. Um, in the second case, uh, the send all queries to one resolver, uh, that obviously in that resolver seeing everything. Uh, if that's a resolver that you believe is not going to leak that data further, that can be uh, an appropriate uh, approach. And having a separate resolver for VPN interface avoids queries via that network leaking, right? So if you don't want uh, the information on what's in the network VPN leaking out into the world, um, that's that's a useful thing to do, but you're probably still going to get a whole bunch of uh, information going to a single resolver. So politicalparty.org, recreationalhabit.com, and traveldestination.info are all still probably going to the same uh, resolver. It's really only your workplace there's an example in this that's going to be separated out. Um, and the privacy implication of the interface list depend on how long the interface is. Um, next slide. So, uh, can different resolver selections improve privacy? Different approaches than the ones above. Uh, next slide, please. Maybe. And you can see that tentative about this uh, this uh, response. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it's pretty clear that carefully selecting the resolvers to include in the candidate set for their privacy properties will help. So for example, if uh, you're concerned about uh, queries being visible on the wire, then select uh, that offers DOT or DOH is clearly uh, an advantage. Uh, and if you have knowledge of their policies, selecting ones um, that match your policies uh, are, are also potentially useful if their privacy properties are included in the policies. Um, but a whole bunch of trade-offs, and we kind of go into them a bit in our draft. Uh, and it turns out not to be at all simple to devise a system that in, in every case is going to improve the privacy of a client. Uh, in, in fact, the, the trade-offs may mean that by protecting the privacy of a single client, you, you may be reducing the, the total set of uh, clients using a specific resolver and thus having implications beyond one client. Um, so uh, before going through those in detail, and in fact, we're probably not going to go through them in detail today at all, um, we wanted to pose these questions to the work. And next slide, please. Uh, and this is sort of the basic, do, do you, is this the right place to solve this problem set of questions? Is the working group willing to consider approaches uh, that result in multiple DNS resolvers being discovered? Because if the answer to that is yes, then we can keep talking. And if the answer is no, that's not really in scope, or we, we as a working group don't want to work on that, uh, then we'll have to find other places to socialize this work. Uh, the second question, if the answer to that does turn out to be yes, um, is the working group willing to consider optimizations in the concentration of information about client activity? And that that's a different optimization uh, than some of the ones we've already discussed. And so it's important uh, to recognize that this is going to involve some trade offs that the working group would have to discuss if you take this. Uh, and the last question is Is the working group willing to work on describing the operational impact of those optimizations? Because there definitely are some operational impacts. Um, and I understand that we're going to take up these questions with the rest of the questions to the working group at the end of the session. So I think that's it for me. Thanks, Ted.
Okay. Uh, next up is Tommy Polly. Tommy, you you on? Yeah, this is for um my being in queue, right? Um, actually, we're gonna take. Uh, the, I think we're gonna do big questions at the end. Is that right, Dave? Or you do you want to do them now? No, 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 no. Like after each presentation. And we still need the proximity to what people were just talking about, I think, to have important contextual awareness. So, okay. so I'm going to turn over to Dave, who's going to manage the question queue for Ted's talk. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, first up is Tommy Pauly. Right, that's where I was confused. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, thanks, uh, Ted, for sharing this. Um, I think it's a really good uh, overview of the question space and how this interacts with privacy considerations. Um, in a way that goes further than what the charter discussion was. Um, I have two, I have one point and then a kind of response to your questions. First, just as like a knit, when you have the ordering of the types of resolvers that you find to be most common, um, you listed, you know, having the one resolver that we use for everything on the device, followed by the split VPN case, followed by the per network case. Um, at least in my experience, I would actually expect that the per network, per local network resolver is going to be the most common, at least as the default for most client operating systems. Um, this is definitely true for iOS and Mac. I imagine it's the same for Microsoft operating systems. When we're on both a Wi-Fi and a cell network, the queries on those different interfaces use what is provisioned locally. Um, and that's really important for a lot of the local network interactions. So I think we should view that kind of as the status quo. Um, and if that's not being done, when we are selecting just one resolver for everything, regardless of the interface, that's breaking a lot of the recommendations about uh, provisioning domains that came out of the multiple interfaces group. Um, then to your questions regarding, um, you know, should we consider approaches that result in multiple DNS resolvers? I think absolutely yes, we do need to be concerned about that as a group. I think it's fundamental to the discussion in the charter, if we're only interested in getting one thing, we're missing a lot of the nuance about how to interact with the network. Um, and I, to the point of reducing the concentration of information, I do think that is very useful, um, but I would challenge us to when we are looking at that to consider the privacy impact and the data leakage, not just in the resolution flow, but in the subsequent connections, um, because that's kind of a whole package about what information is getting out. We don't consider how we send our names in TLS, um, SNI, et cetera, then we're missing the whole picture. But thank you for this. Uh, thank you, Tommy. And now Mohit Sethi, please. Oh, hi. Uh, so, Ted, thank you for the presentation. My question was uh, about the interface selection. So, I, I, I'm assuming that. What you mean by interfaces, if, if a device has multiple interfaces like Ethernet, Wi-Fi, and mobile broadband, then you perhaps use uh, different DNS resolvers for them. Uh, I, I guess there needs to be some, some more detailed information, like is it, is it fine that you discovered that DNS resolver on that interface, but that interface is no longer up because most stacks currently allow you to only have one network interface up at a time. I know there is MPTCP and, and so on, but even though the laptop I'm currently using does support all three, I'm currently connected only with it, with mobile broadband. So I think some perhaps some more explanation whether that interface needs to be up or like can I also use the DNS res resolver that was discovered when the interface was up in the past, but is no longer um, up and running, and I'm no longer sending traffic on on that. Uh, yeah, I, I guess some more explanation would be useful. Uh, thank you. Improve the language in the draft around that. Um, I think uh, the primary thing that we're trying to get at, though, is if you have multiple interfaces, um, which has a different DNS resolver associated. Uh, with that interface, it it could be uh, the large scale case of a split DNS, right? That I think Tommy was referencing, uh, where each one of these interfaces might have names uh, that are available only via that network, um, or um, have that are only accessible through that network. So 
code, you would associate the name resolution uh, to a specific network interface using that. Um, I think we anticipate ADD coming up with different strategies than the ones we've uh, had in the past for discovery of uh, DNS resolvers. And then the question becomes, um, does that set of um, mechanisms take this potential um, optimization into account? Um, and I think if there are different uh, mechanisms being developed, we might not end up in the situation where the answer to your question is particularly obvious. So I think we would have to work through that to the work up. Thank you, um, Mohit. Um, and now Ben Schwartz, please. I, I just want to make also a quick note that I'm going to close the mic queue after um, Warren, who had just signed on. And uh, because we're going to try to get the next presentation to keep it on time at uh, 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 half past the hour. Uh, you're up, Ben. Okay, I'll drop Ben down one in the queue if uh, Pete Resnick is ready to talk. Oh, yep, Ben just said in chat that his mic isn't working right now. So, uh, Pete, can you come on while Ben tries to get that sorted? You bet. Um, so, one suggestion for the draft and then a question. The suggestion being, um, and especially given what um, uh, uh, Tommy said, thank you, Breen, about um, the ordering of these things, it does seem to me that the VPN case is basically subsumed by the multiple interface case, because what you're talking about is the multiple interface case, but one of the interfaces happens to be a virtual interface. It's acting almost entirely the same as the common case for multiple interfaces. So I don't know that you necessarily need to separate those two out. Maybe you want to make a separate claim about with multiple interfaces, there are two ways to deal with them. One is to ask them all the same question, and one is to ask only, you know, particular ones for particular cases. Um, but I think it's worth uh, having a go with that. Um, as far as my question, if the working group does answer yes to the first question, that they're considering these kinds of different approaches, what what do the authors here want to have happen? That this is a working group document um, that is sort of like a use case document, or is this just a standing draft that eventually will go poof uh, and once the protocols are developed? Or it, it doesn't seem to fit into charter. So I was wondering what what your plan was. I want to know if this is an appropriate discuss the draft, right? And so if the answer is. Uh, that we develop in the course of that discussion ends up in driving some aspect of the protocol. That's a great result. Uh, we may or may not want to publish the draft. It sort of depends on what the out output is. Um, it's certainly possible that one output is we discuss this and discover that the answer is that this optimization is not something that we're actually going to be able to achieve, and recording that somehow might also. Uh, but I think it's primarily is this the work. Working group mailing list, we're going to talk about this on. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Um, thank you, Pete. Uh, I'm waiting for Ben to reply that his mic seems to be okay. So I'm going to skip ahead now to. Uh... Hey now? Oh, yeah, we can. Okay, great. Okay. Well, Schwartz. Thank you. Um, so I haven't heard the other responses, uh, but. On the questions as phrased, I would say, yes, the working group should consider approaches that result in multiple resolvers being discovered. I think that's unavoidable. Um, is the working group willing to consider optimizations for reducing the concentration of information? I think that the word optimization implies the ability to, uh, to evaluate an objective function to tell up from down. And I think we really don't have that level of understanding about the implications of uh, of where these queries go. So instead of optimizations for reducing the concentration, I would just say 
configurations that alter the concentration and leave it to uh, a future future group or to users and implementers to determine what's uh, what's optimal. And on describing the operational impact of those optimizations, similarly, I think that we should spec we should not speculate. Uh, we can certainly describe obvious interactions with other existing systems, but I don't think that we should guess at higher order effects that they're likely to have. I do think that there's real potential work here for the IRTF privacy enhancements research group to try to figure out what happens when DNS queries are distributed or concentrated in different ways. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ben. I just want a quick note. We have uh, five people still left to go in the queue, and we just hit half past the hour. Um, I'm not going to cut you off right now, but if you could please keep your comments brief. Uh, we do have a little bit of uh, buffer room built into the schedule, and so uh, for kind of extended thoughts that might occur, uh, let's save them towards the end of the meeting. Thank you. And so next up is uh, Sanjay Mishra. Um, yes, this is Sanjay. Uh, hi, hi, Ted. Uh, thanks for the presentation. And I think the questions that you have, um, all three are very valid questions and something I believe um, uh, fits with the charter of the group. So uh, certainly um, the, the group should be looking at all these uh, three important issues. Um, I have looked at the draft earlier, but I, I can't, I have to look back again. But I wanted to ask if, uh, if, if you have had chance to see how the distributed uh, resolvers would uh, impact on the latency on um, on the queries. Uh, we're not currently in the draft at all, to be honest. But okay, I, I get it. So is this something that the uh, should you uh, move forward with the draft? Is that something that would be considered uh, as part of the uh, the overall approaches, given that this is talking about distributed resolvers? So I think it definitely would be by the, the work of the working group at, at some level, but I'm not sure that it would be distinct in, in looking at this as opposed to uh, part of the overall set of work items of the working group to consider um, when you're a resolver for a particular a policy characteristic and there's a really pessimal latency impact what do you do? I think that's a question that the working group will have to answer more broadly than just in this context. All right, thank you. Okay, just to keep things moving because Chris might be having microphone problems. Uh, Eric, Chris Corla, please. Um, so I, I think that like there's a bunch you sort of raising here, Ted. Um, I think there's a there's a there's an interesting problem in here sneaking trying to trying to climb out of the presentation, which is say you have a bunch of apparently equivalent um, resolvers. How ought you to, to to manage your queries for privacy? And I think that that section that that section of the draft is is pretty interesting. Um, um, and in particular, a lot of things people obviously might want to do like are really terrible. So it's like really good to have that pulled out. Um, I guess I'm not sure I'm as interested in the questions you're raising on this slide, um, um, in part because um, uh, you know some of them seem like not really the questions that this draft raises. Um, um, I, I think the best place for this draft would be to be an analysis draft, which is the analysis draft answering the question which I just indicated. Um, I think the sort of the the questions of like where the drafts are like where the, where the resolvers are like not really equivalent is like really hard to like think about, and I, I I'm not like a huge fan of trying to reason about it. Um, the um, uh, I, I just want to flag, um, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, 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 sorry, sorry, uh, uh, Ty Polly um, said, you know, um, we should think about like, you know, treating the network resolver as the default. Um, please don't say that. Um, like that's just status quo bias about like the fact that the way things have historically been not the way things necessarily should be. Uh, thanks for the feedback, Ecker. I'll, I'll just note that there are some cases in which we can't really Assume that the set of DNS results are equivalent. I, I, I agree. The VP, yeah, and so uh, you may have two different things you have to worry about. Is like, is this a condition in which I have to go to a resolver because it's the only one that can give me an answer, which is a classic split DNS problem, or okay, now I don't have that problem, and now in the second stage of analysis of where I'm going to send this, I can now take into account that. Uh, 
training set I have determined are equivalent either from the fact that they're open or they're or whatever it is that's going to cause them to be equivalent. Um, basically, that they're all going to return the same answer to the same query. Sure. Um, you agree with that this two parts of the Yes, I agree that there are that those two parts that I'm not sure if people can hear me because I was getting glitches, but I agree those are the two parts of the tree. I guess I'm suggesting focusing on the second one, not the first. Okay, great. great. Thank you. Um, the, the last in queue right now, Jim is going to hold his questions to the end. So Chris's uh, microphone seems to be fixed now. Chris Fox, with yep. his comments. Okay, all right. Um, so I was going to say plus one, yes, I think this is a topic that needs to be explored by the working group. Um, on the list, I was trying to make a couple of points. Um, the first was that using multiple resolvers implies multiple privacy policies. So if the user were to rank these in preference order and using more than one implies you're accepting the second best and the third best and so on. Um, yeah, so we've had some discussion about, yes, well, all of the ones that we're looking at are good enough, but I think it might not be so straightforward. The second point is that the current model of using a stub resolver in the home re requires trust in that forwarder, but outside the home, all recursives have no visibility of the individual clients inside the home because they only see the aggregated view. Um, moving to clients using additional resolvers outside the current network implies sharing that per client identification with those resolvers. Um, so that's that's a privacy loss in some sense. Whether it's an issue, it needs more exploration. Um, but I do accept that if the local stub resolver is insecure or compromised, yes, that's an issue. That's a big issue. Um, so that's it, really. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. And as I said, Jim will hold, hold his comments to the end. And so back to you, Glenn. Great. And thanks, everybody. Uh, I'd just like to remind people, uh, we seem to be missing a few people uh, on the blue sheet um, sign up in the Etherpad. So if you're on, uh, please go there and sign up with your name and affiliation. All right, Tommy Polly, you're the next contestant. All right, thank you very much. So um, this is going to be an update on some of the thoughts we've been having around draft that we presented last time in Deprive and in the ABCD both. Um, I apologize, I haven't actually updated the draft yet, um, but I did want to have this discussion, especially in light of some of the stuff we were talking about in the last presentation. Next slide, please. All right, so I mean, the goals that we have in this, which I think align very much with the goals that we've described in the charter, or that we want to be able to discover that resolvers are there, regardless of how many we use. And we want to discover um, them both locally and remotely and discover that they can do go or dot, et cetera. And we also want to figure out information about the resolver, um, information that can help us decide as a client when to use this resolver, um, if we have multiple available to us, and if there are any special capabilities of this resolver um, are there names that it claims split DNS capability for? Are there things that we have to do in order to get through a captive portal, et cetera? Uh, next slide, please. So I just drew a couple pictures here that can help us talk about this area. Um, so here's what I'm describing as like a status quo model. We have multiple devices. They each have their own local DNS server. If they're on the same network, this would be the same one. And they're reaching out to different websites. Um, or other resources as they're resolving these names. The next slide. So when we go to a model that we have kind of one or some centralized list of trusted remote resolvers, we imagine now that we are not using local infrastructure, we have some remote Go server or dot server as it may be. We do all of our resolution there, and then we get to the same servers at the end of the day. Um, so this definitely has some Benefits of not exposing names to the local resolvers, but as um, was brought up in the last conversation, you know, maybe this is centralizing more information onto that 
one server, we need to make sure we can trust that external resolver pretty well. And it also doesn't change any of the stance about what is exposed about the um, end web service that we're getting to. Next slide, please. All right, so we can also have multiple servers. Um, I think when we talk about multiple resolvers here, there is a big question of how do we know when we should use them if we have multiple. Um, there are different strategies that you could take. You could just distribute it. Um, it could be up to the client. But next slide. Um, what we are discussing in this document is trying to couple the notion of which resolver we use with um, which names we're trying to access. Now, this does require some bootstrapping or um, figuring out what your names are in general. But when I'm accessing names within a particular domain, let's say, for example, .com, and I have lots of sub resources on example.com that may give more information about what I'm doing, it seems like one of the best privacy stances and efficiency stances in general is to have that information centralized with the entity, um, entity in quotes, that is actually going to be serving that content because it um, is both authoritative for it, um, but also is already going to be receiving my connections. And so the amount of data for granular lookups that's being leaked out into the world is minimized. Next slide, please. All right, so this is one approach you could have to how to use um, multiple remote resolvers. Um, so in general, why are we interested in designating as we're calling resolvers for, for domains? So the argument here is that having the same entity terminate your TLS or HTTPS connections, also terminating your DO um, gives you good benefits. Um, it does reduce the number of entities that seeing the names that you're accessing for a given client IP address, um, assuming that you have to talk to this server anyway at the end of the day. Um, and while it is true that this entity that you're resolving to is going to see many resolutions for things under example.com, for example, um, it's also the entity that is serving the names or is at least related to that entity. Um, so it's probably aware of these clients anyway. Um, it also becomes easier to have optimizations later. So if we want to be able to have a client upgrade its connection from a DO connection into a normal TLS connection, let's say Google at some point was able to do DO onto one of its servers, and then I could just upgrade into another connection. Having a notion in which I know that I should be doing my resolutions to the server is a beneficial thing. So next slide, please. Um, so, the way that we are talking about discovering, as we presented previously, is by advertising the existence of these resolvers in DNS records themselves. And this is a relationship in which when I do a resolution and request a record, in this case, a HTTP service record or a service binding record for a given domain, it can include a DO URI template that it knows is authoritative for that domain. And the reason we're using this is that it's the same mechanism that we're already going to have to request um, for getting the encrypted TLS client hello, the um, ESNI previously that's being renamed. So if I'm already requesting that, it's nice to bootstrap also um, knowing that there is a DO resolver that I can do for more specific queries in the future. And note that this is kind of involving a bootstrapping step. So either I'm doing this request on the local resolver to a trusted remote resolver or VSM proxying or oblivious method. Um, and then similarly, we need to be able to discover local resolvers. Um, and the proposal here is to use extended information on the provisioning domain, which comes from your RAs or DHCP to get um, a notion of how to access your local resolver in encrypted fashion. Next slide, please. All right. Um, so as far as getting resolver information, the um, proposal here is to have information that we can get specifically from a DOE server off of a um, JSON blob that we're, we're just using the provisioning domain existing blob here. 
Um, so if we access a specific well-known URL off of that server, um, specific to this DNS URL template, we can get more information that can be extensible about this server. Um, this information can include um, the URI template itself um, that can be useful when you have a local PVD that tells you here's my um, here's my DOE server. And it also allows giving hints or information about um, split DNS and other domains that we want to include. Next slide, please. All right, so this, um, this designation does need to be trusted in some form. And that's why I want to spend the rest of this time going over. If we do have DNSSEC signed records, that we believe is a good um, indication that the owner of this domain, and the, the entity managing it, is aware of the DOE server or the DOT server that you are designating. And therefore, we have some reasonable reason to believe that this designation should be trusted. And this could be done on the local network as well. So if your local network actually did own Comcast owned Xfinity namespace, they could let you know that the local resolver was indeed authoritative for that and designated. However, um, we have certainly gotten a lot of feedback and we recognize that it's not always possible um, to deploy DNSSEC easily, especially for very large deployments that may come at some point, but that's not an easy bar right now. So we've been looking at other mechanisms to get a similar form of trust. Um, so in the same way that we want to have a relationship in which the owner of the name is kind of pointing back to the DOE template or whatever other encrypted resolver you have, we want to have some proof that the owner of this name is pointing back. So the proposal here is that we could have in my extended information about my resolver, a hint that it claims that it's designated by example.com, but then we can go independently do a separate resolution for the top level domain of example.com without using the DOE server at all, fetch it, do TLS to there. And if we see that indeed a well-known URL at example.com says, yes, this is my DOE server, then we have some reason to trust this. It's more round trips to do this bootstrapping, but it can get a similar effect to DNSSEC. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, I'm working on it. Sorry. It's funny that that's all the slides for your deck, Tommy. Uh, do you know? Do I have an older deck? No, I think that I can I try to resend it to you. Um... Oh, hang on. But hang on. It says page 10 to 15. Give me a second here. There should be a, just yeah, a few more diagrams at the end. Yeah. Preview <laughs> is being difficult. Uh oh. It doesn't want to advance the next slide. Hang on. If it's not coming up, it's not critical. It's mainly um, it was just some diagrams to explain that last point. I have to restart preview. A second here. Okay. I'm going to kill preview and restart it because it doesn't want to advance to any next slide. So give me one second, please. Sounds good.
Okay, I'm making a play option here that uh, as long as Glenn, oh, maybe he's ready. There. Yep. Okay. Uh, nope, doesn't want to invite, advance the next slide. Give me one second. Let me see what's going on. Okay, so, well, we have a couple in queue right now. So while you're fiddling with that, um, uh, Eric Riscorla, did you want to jump in with your first comments here? Sure. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is cool. Um, uh, I, I want to make two points, one trivial and technical and one more substantial. Um, the trivial and technical one is you indicate that this is the same information as is needed for ESNI. And that, that is at some level true, but at some level it's false. And the level at which it's false is that ESNI does not really require the data to be authenticated. Um, um, this is kind of counterintuitive and is covered in the draft in, in the SNI draft quite a bit. But the, the executive summary is that once you control the DNS, then like the SNI information is effectively lost because you can, like for instance, return a unique address for every SNI. And so like, and so having the, the, the DSNI crypto keys authenticated isn't very important. Um, whereas that's not true here for, for, for obvious reasons. Um, the, um, um, because you know you're, you're, for instance, detouring the traffic from you know your huh, from one place to another. Um, the, um, um, the 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 more uh, uh, more relevant point or more larger point, and I think you and I have talked about this before, is that this seems to have some really quite severe failure cases. Um, um, and, and so, for example, imagine you have a um, a domain served by two CDNs, A and B. And ordinarily, A would get 10% of the traffic and B would get 90% of the traffic and you use Sidexis for us to swap them, right? Um, so what happens is that the, the structure of this is basically that um, because you're pinning people um, to whatever they happen to get, um, if the CDNs both do this, it's very easy to end up in a situation where basically um, temporary uh, traffic shifts um, persist and are hard to fix. Um, in particular, like imagine B is down and A is covering all the traffic, then like almost impossible to get the traffic back to B until like all these things expire. So um, I, I think I floated this to you before, and I, I, I um, so I guess I like to understand how you think you're going to fix that, um, or maybe that's just something to, that that the working group has to work on. Okay, and before you yeah, do, for Tommy, that, I just yeah. want to say, uh, Glenn, it looks like you're back online and working. So after you uh, continue with your response to Eric, Tommy, could you then just run right back into your slides? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thanks, Ecker. Um, yeah, to the point about ESNI not requiring um, DNSSEC, that's absolutely true. Um, I think my main reason for bootstrapping this on the same thing is just that it's a request we have to make. Um, requesting DNSSEC information doesn't hurt, even if it's not there. Um, Agreed. Yeah. For the other point, um, could, could you just repeat the last bit a little bit again? For the second time? So, yeah. So, so, I mean, so my assumption is that the, the, the way you will typically deploy this will be that um, that every 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 person in the limit, every large like service provider serving um, you know any domain will want to advertise that it um, that it will, ha will handle the uh, uh, the, the DNS resolution for that domain, right? Because because that, that's where you get the maximum privacy benefit. So um, imagine you have a situation where, so to example.com is served by CDN A and CDN B, and they both advertise um, you know records that say, hey, look, I'm like the person who's responsible for this, right? Um, and that's especially obvious in the in the HTTPS case, which you indicate here. Um, and so um, and so my, my concern is that that makes the um, the traffic allocation at any given time extraordinarily stable and hard to change. So in particular, um, like say I all my traffic goes to CDNA. Um, and um, then I went to a new CDNB. Well, that like, takes a long time, so all these records have to expire. Um, and um, so I think I think we need some story how to deal with that. I'm not sure what that what that is. And I'm hoping you have one, but if not, I guess we'll have to work on yeah. one. <laughs> so I think that's something that I do want to get more input from the group on. I, I see two different um, deployment solutions to this area. One is that a given entity that is distributing its traffic between multiple CDNs could have one single um, notion of its DOE resolver that's in charge of splitting the traffic between the two. Um, that's kind of like this virtual entity that's not necessarily the CDN itself, but some intermediary that's working on behalf of the domain owner for both sides. But alternatively, there's no reason that when I request a um, HTTP service record for a given name, it can't have answers back to me of saying that it actually has two different designated servers that both check out. And perhaps we use the priorities in those records to kind of do the weight balancing of who's going to where. So I think there are different ways we can look at it, um, but we'd want some more 
CDN input on the details here. All right, so to finish the slides out, this is just demonstrating um, the scenarios that we have um, specific to the DNSSEC validation or the lack of DNSSEC. So in the case in which we are able to get a DNSSEC signed record that says example.com designates the valid DOE server, everything's fine, we can do our DOE queries directly to that server for everything under example.com from then on. Next slide, please. Um, the concern is that if you have unsigned records, we of course can't trust those because anyone could just put example.com designates attacker DOE server, and then all of a sudden I use that and you're redirecting my traffic. Next slide, please. So the mitigation that we're talking about using, which does have more round trips, is that I have an unsigned record for example.com. Um, it says, if it says a valid DOE server, I can connect to that DOE server, not request any user traffic, but simply um, do an informational query onto it to get its blob. In that it could say, yes, uh, example.com trust me. We then go do a query separately using another DNS resolution source, find example.com and validate that example.com indeed designates the valid DOE server. Next slide. Um, so the attacker case, in this case, we would, if they tried to do the same thing, unless the valid um, server with the TLS cert for example.com did designate the attacker DOE server, it would break the chain there and we would no longer um, trust that. Anyway, so that's just a helpful diagram for people and other questions and we can wrap this up. Don't take too much time. Uh, so you're up now, Puneet, please, Puneet Sood. Okay, because we have a lot to talk about. Uh, I realize people are having mic issues and all, and uh, as with previous cases, you'll just get bumped down in the queue. Hopefully Eric Nygren's mic is working. Is this mic working? Is mic working? That sounds like, oh, is that you, Puni? Um, so I was saying that um, to Edgar's concern about the um, um, the multi CDN case, one approach would be for the name Sorry, that you just let me interrupt you really quickly, mean. Eric. Just I just want to be clear for the note takers. This is in fact Eric Nygren speaking. This, yeah, this is Eric Nygren speaking. Um, is it to Edgar's concern for the case where you try to have the um, P, well known PPD file that? That domain you can set that on. If there's a way to do that based upon the name that was in the um, the uh, service domain name of the HTTPS service record to so the target of that, since that would be distinct per CDN, um, that might address that issue. I'll put an example into the into the Jabber chat. Great, thank you, Tommy. Do you have a response or? That sounds good. Thank you for sharing that, and we can discuss offline. Okay, um, Puneet, is your mic going yet? Okay, on to Andrew Campling, please. Hi, is my mic working? Yep, I agree, Jay. Yeah, uh, uh, hi, Tommy. Um, obviously, it's a, I think it's a very sort of slick uh, uh, way of uh, d doing discovery. Um, the one thing you didn't touch on the, in the presentation, um, how would I as a user express my preferences um, because at, at the moment it looks like the machine's taken control from me. Um, uh, if I want to uh, uh, curtail uh, it, it from just going wherever it wants to, how might I say I only want to go to particular resolvers or uh, only those with particular policies um, rather than, than let it fly wherever it sees fit? Yeah, that's a great point and a great question. Um... I think that is something that the working group does need to talk about. And I think, well, it's like the item three on the charter um, kind of covers that. This, what I'm talking about here is purely about the discovery 
and discovery of information, not at all how it's used. Um, I think the client always needs to re retain the uh, authority to ignore the information. It's always going to have that ability. Um, so I think that's a follow on discussion that we need to have. Okay, thanks. One more try, Puni. Uh, ben Schwartz, please. Ben, I know your mic was working last time. Okay, Puni and Ben are bumped down. Just uh, Ralph Weber, please. Hello, mic check. Can you hear me? We read you. Okay, so. Um, one of the things uh, that you actually do with that draft, and I think we discussed this before, is that the resolution is part is kind of pushed back to the client, or the client is doing the resolution part. There might be some situations where this actually um, kind of distributes more information about the client than in the current scenario, because if you ask for a call, everybody up the chain pretty much, if you ask them via a regular resolver what the authority for that gets is the IP address of the resolver, whereas in this case, uh, if you have a DOE or DOT server at a higher level domain, then you'll get sort of all the queries from all the clients, so you can actually connect the client um, kind of population and do something with it. Uh, that might be something to think about to maybe improve on. Yeah, and that's definitely a good point. Um, we. That's why to the earlier um, discussion we we're having of you know when do we distribute our resolutions, I think we need to take into account both which resolvers we're using, but also the ultimate connections we're making. Um, so if you were doing resolutions without ever making connections I, to the same entity, I think that definitely is a problem. Um, I think if we can have a way to limit it such that for the names under google.com, I only am talking to the Google Doe server, it presumably is already in a place in which it's receiving these TLS connections later. So hopefully it's not able to gather more information because it's about to receive those names anyway. But that's um, something we continue to be concerned about. Yeah, I mean, uh, DNS has sort of not infinite, but uh, can have very long trees. And while we are used to sort of having uh, top level and second level, there are other deployment models also where, sure. where, the, where the kind of Trees are deeper. Uh, thank you, Ralph. Puneet is finally back. Hi. Second try. Can you hear me? We do. Okay. So, Tommy, I'll try to be quick. So, the question is this works well when the DNS and the web servers are operated by the same entity. But for smaller providers where they've outsourced their DNS, this would actually result in providing more information about the client to different entities. And uh, my, my concern is that the large websites are generally public, so no one cares if I go to google.com or apple.com, but they do necessarily probably care more if I go to a less popular website. So I'm not sure uh, there'll be a net improvement in privacy for the client. Yep, that's definitely um, a Good point as well. I think for the case in which you have a small website that is being run on a CDN, um, like let's say I have something, a one-off website that I'm concerned about, and it's running on Cloudflare, it's running on GoDaddy or whatever. In those cases, if the entity that is authoritative for the resolving and the connections is that CDN rather than your particular website that may have good properties. But yes, if you are running your own server completely independently, then um, we do need to be concerned about that case. Okay, and uh, just a quick note from the chairs, we are actually have used up a lot of our buffer in this session. Um, so we will finish with the two comments uh, from the current mic line, but please keep this in mind for the uh, following presentations. 
So first relaying uh, from Ben Schwartz on Jabber. I understand how the scheme improves privacy when combined with oblivious DNS, but in the absence of oblivious DNS, which is out of scope for ADD, I think this is only a privacy improvement for certain assumptions about TTLs and some queries will leak when TTLs expire. I'd like to see those assumptions clarified and see if there's a simpler solution such as using long lived C names. I also want some consideration about whether these long TTLs are a tracking vector. That's a good discussion. And that's one that we've been having and I think we should continue on our GitHub and in the group. Okay, awesome. And for uh, the last question now or comment, uh, Warren Kamari, please. So thanks for the mic. This is Warren Kamari. So someone, I think it was Tommy Pauly said that, <clears throat> Um, you know, we should only use the Google resolver for Google names, which initially sounds like a grand idea, except that I don't know what a Google name is, right? There's Google.com, there's Google user content, there's Gmail, there's thousands of other names. And so unless I have a way of knowing beforehand what name should be mapped to a resolver, I can't do that. And if I know what name should be mapped to a resolver, I don't need to ask the question because I already know the answer. So I think that that's something where this sort of scheme needs a lot more discussion. And that, I think that's the bootstrapping question. Um, if we have some oblivious mechanism that we're doing the initial resolution over, then that's slower, but we can trust it. Um, alternatively, there's nothing stopping you from having a, you know, let's say one trusted resolver that you use for your default queries. That you think has good properties, but then once you learn that, oh, this domain I didn't know about actually is a Google name, then you switch it over. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Tommy. Back to Glenn to push on to the next. All right. So our next uh, session is going to be Dan Wing, who's going to talk about two different drafts. So, Dan, are you on? Yes, I am. Okay. I will bring up your thing in. You're on. Uh, so my name is Dan Wing. Uh, next slide. Um, we're going to uh, quickly talk about, I got a 20 minute slot. I'm gonna try to give some time back, uh, quickly talk about uh, the outline of, of this draft and, and where we're trying to go with it. Next slide, please. So our scope for this draft is how to discover DOE and, and DOT servers on a private or local network. We're concentrating first on on home networks, we have a separate document that we're working on for enterprise networks, uh, but we wanted to hit the home networks first. It's most relatable. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so again, uh, we're just doing home networks. Enterprise networks are out of scope. Um, and we're talking about server discovery mechanisms and the steps required to get them bootstrapped. Next slide, please. Um, so this is showing a uh, situation where there's a, a managed CPE, a CPE managed by an ISP uh, talking to an, uh, the top diagram is showing, talking to an ISP managed uh, DNS. So like Comcast in the United States is like this. The bottom one is an ISP managed CPE, which is configured by the ISP to go to some cloud um, based uh, resolver like uh, 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. Um, over DOT or over um, uh, DOH for both of these. Next slide, please. And then uh, same situation with an unmanaged CPE. So this is where the, the homeowner um, has uh, installed their own equipment and is overriding what the ISP provided modem or cable modem or network equipment is doing. Uh, and both of the configurations are supported here as well. Next slide, please. And this shows the information necessary for classic uh, DNS over 53 and DOT and DOH um, that they all need a list of IP addresses that they get from somewhere, either by making queries or getting them directly. Uh, and then DOT and DOH need an authenticated domain name and DOE is unique in that it also needs the URI template in order to describe all the different services and capabilities available at that DOE server. Next slide, please. And in our document, we, we discuss ways to discover this information. So of course, for classic DNS over 53, 
the existing DHCP and RA options are what are used. The yellow shows that what we're proposing is the reference identifier discussed in the document um, for getting the authenticated domain name. And then the URI templates are also discussed in the document, how to obtain those. Slide, please. Uh, and this introduced ver verifies, excuse me, verified resolver. Uh, we talk about what that is in a couple of slides, but this is the the message flow diagram for for how that is supposed to work. The purpose of this is to make sure that rogue resolvers are noticed and and are uh, rejected by the the client. This works by um, having a list of what the verified resolvers are, and when we connect to a resolver that we're given um, by the local network, we verify the signatures that we can obtain from its certificate that we get over TLS. Next slide, please. And it shows the pre-configuration that, that occurs for the verified resolver. Next slide, please. And this discusses what a verified resolver is. Um, so for the auto upgrade case where we switch to encrypted DNS, either DOT or DOH, it's the uh, IP address of that server. And if we're doing ADN, it's that ADN value. We also discuss a situation where the, in, in the draft, it, where the, resolver or i'm sorry where the server is obtained a certificate a signature from a certificate authority that is an auditor so it's separate from the operator next slide please one of the other things in the draft and we may want to discuss this and pull this out uh, because it's um and probably appealing for some other situations, uh, but we need to discuss it more for sure, is when the ISP is operating a DOS server, it may want to reflect back or, or send back those queries uh, to the ISP operated CPE uh, to help shed the load uh, and get faster resolution inside the home so it doesn't have to suffer going up, the, up and back down the access link. Um, so the mechanism that uh, we have in the document, next slide please, on how to do that is uh, to do an HTTP redirect. Now remember this is an ISP managed CPE, so the ISP knows what the internal IP addresses are at that home because it manages the CPE and it can send this redirect back to that CPE. It knows um, and manages the certificates on there as well. Um, so that can be a um, a DOS server that is signed by the ISP or signed by the auditor, depending on which direction we go through, go forward with. Um, but this seemed like a nice technique for getting the ISP DOS server offloaded in much the same way that happens today with resolvers and with DNS mask um, running in residential CPE. Next slide, please. And those servers and URI templates, uh, so this describes why we need them um, and how we propose to get them. Uh, this is a, a pending issue. There's been some discussion on the mailing list um, about uh, best ways to do this, best ways to move forward on this. <clears throat> uh, next slide talks about some trade-offs uh, in different mechanisms that uh, we've considered in the document. And uh, this, this is something we need some more discussion on the mailing list and in the working group for part of the reason I'm rushing through the presentation um, so we can uh, get some more feedback on this. Next slide, please. One of the values of having a um, DOS server or, or DOT server running in the home is that it can identify the different clients inside the house because it can see the MAC address and the IP address of those devices and, and identify that it's a, a child's device or a parent's device and provide different filtering either for content or for malware uh, for that device. An IoT device needs different filtering uh, than a, um, a, a kid's uh, PC. Uh, so this allows that to occur if the resolution is at the ISP. Um, it's more difficult. There's ways to accomplish that, but it's more difficult to accomplish that because of the NAT that is typically performed at the uh, residential device for IPv4. 
Next slide, please. Um, there is implementation that's been done privately. We don't have that available publicly yet. Um, uh, that that does nearly everything that is described in our internet draft. And then finally, the last slide is the next slide. Are there any questions? Um, first up is Jim Reed. Uh, please try in your least Scottish accent, Jim. I don't have a Scottish accent, guys. Um, most of the verified resolvers, does that have the possibility for an unscrupulous ISP to pick the client or the end user that it's using a specific set of DNS services or servers? So our intent there is if you're a uh, subscriber to Comcast, you would tell your client, I like Comcast, DNA, Comcast signed um, DOE servers. And then you would use them. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Martin Thompson, please. So I, I think there's a there's an interesting question there in, in terms of whether we trust a particular uh, server. And it's kind of sad that we're at the point where you have lists at, at endpoints. But my question was more about the um, your expectations about updating CPE. My experience with all of these things is that CPE doesn't get upgraded. And so assuming that something like this would happen in CPE so that such that it pro provides the DHCP options that you're talking about um, seems a little unrealistic. We've talked to ISPs and they're quite unwilling to, to make any changes to, ISP, uh, to CPEs for, for that reason. Anything to add there? I don't have anything to add there. I'm certainly familiar and is familiar with that and, and agree with that analysis. Okay, uh, thank you. Ralph Leber, bitte. Hello. So uh, thanks a lot for that. It's uh, the kind of CPE angle was something that I always thought a lot about. And uh, I, quite contrary to what my predecessor said, is that there are ISPs that manage their CPEs. And on these devices, there are frequent updates. These devices are managed. You can kind of uh, rely on them being up to speed and uh, being uh, there for, for the subscriber. Now, thing, the question is, you always say sort of do and do when it comes to the connection between the CPE and the ISP resolver and uh, between the, well, client and the CPE. Uh, is there anything kind of that prohibits us to dot? Um, all of the slide diagrams do uh, discuss dot and do. The only thing that prevents dot is the HTTP redirect that we're proposing to offload the ISP's DOH server. I mean, with all service, we also can, I'm not sure if that is applicable here, but, uh, or a, well, what's the other thing? I can't remember the name now. There is a possibility from HTTP to get to another protocol, I believe. So maybe we could use that. Uh, we might be able to use that. Um, I'll, I'll take a note of that and see if we can work on a way to do that. Okay, thanks. And uh, Wes Hardiker, please. All right, uh, I guess make sure you hear me, yes? Okay. Um, see, one important takeaway, if uh, based on academic research done lately in terms of uh, TTLs, is that if you move resolvers into uh, home devices, and and with the incredibly short TTLs that are out there in the field today, which are mostly around you know five minutes, sometimes they're up to an hour, but um, the common practice is unfortunately five minutes. You end up suffering with a a very uh, delayed query when one of the whole points of using an upstream resolver is, is to do caching across multiple users so that you end up you know, caching uh, those websites for a longer period of time. Uh, so without forwarding, that's something to consider, but the instant you start forwarding, you lose some of the privacy benefits. Uh, so there's sort of a, a rock and a hard place to choose between there. Yes, that's true. Um, and there's also prefetching that, that is possible to you know, prevent the the delay that occurs with a short TTL. Um, 
I, I agree, and, and that that probably needs some more discussion uh, in the draft, and, and perhaps at the working group too. Yeah, the problem with prefetching is you end up prefetching the entire internet. So. Yep. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, I was just doing a, I closed the mic line, but uh, someone had jumped on the end after, and I was just doing a time check with Glenn. Glenn, how are we on time? Uh, I think we should move on. Okay, apologies for that then. Uh, and uh, yep, moving on. Uh, so Dan, you are up next. Let me bring that one up. Here we go. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, next slide, please. And next slide, let's go to slide three. Um, so this is a, a presentation on DNS server selection um, with an assertion to token. Um, so here we're trying to <clears throat> here we're trying to decide which DNS servers um, we we want to pick. Um, and, and it's, a, it's a simple pick, not like what Ted was talking about earlier, where we rotate through, but, but a, a static choice. Um, and, and next slide, please. So what we want to add uh, to the, the selection is um, resolver information about its capabilities. So whether or not it does DNS filtering, for example, um, and to use that in combination with existing PBD-like techniques to decide which server to talk to. Um, so, and we also uh, would like notification when the policy changes or when the DNS filtering is reconfigured. So if the filtering is turned on or turned off, um, is to have the client get a notification of that because it now may want to change to a different DNS server that follows the policies that it likes or um, has the filtering that it likes. Uh, and we also want a way uh, for the the human and also for the um, the computer itself uh, to identify and locate the privacy policy statement uh, in order to do something useful with that. And we're not talking about parsing it. We had talked about that before, uh, but we're not talking about parsing it. We're leaving that up to the end user who, as we all know, don't read the end user license agreements, but that still seems to be the, the best thing that, that we can do. Next slide, please. So currently, we're we're proposing making this choice on filtering capabilities, and which is uh, DNS filtering for malware and DNS filtering for for policy like objectionable content and things like that. For again, all kind of home network sort of situations, um, and then also uh, QNA minimal, minimalization, uh, and whether or not the DNS uh, server you're talking to supports that. Slide, please. Um, and the uh, policy attestation is a signature by whoever runs the DNS server. So if Comcast is running a DNS server, they would sign this. And then they may have an outside auditor who uh, validates that, yes, that's how they set it up. That's what they're really doing. And, and they could sign this as well. Um, and then these would be signed by registered organizations. <clears throat> and the important point is that last bullet is that the DNS client is configured to trust uh, the signer of the pad object. So that either that is their ISP, Comcast, for example, the auditor, if they like what the auditor has done, you know, uh, Ernst & Young or whoever might uh, be the auditor uh, that validates that. Next slide, please. And this is just the mechanics of the privacy assertion token uh, and how we sign that. In the, in the uh, issues of time, let's jump to the example on the next slide, please. And this is uh, an example of uh, a DNS server that is doing malware blocking, uh, but is not doing any policy block blocking. Uh, a privacy URL that is accessible for the user to look at and where the auditor uh, and, and their URL um, information is, is located. Next slide, please. And when either of those change, we're proposing to do uh, a, a push that is sent back to the client to tell to tell it to go and relook at the new updated uh, privacy policy or the new updated filtering policies that are being used at that uh, you know, server. Next slide, please. 
And the privacy statement URL is something humanly readable. Um, the, the, the high level idea here is uh, changes to that can be noticed um, when we connect to it or we get the push. And users can review that information and decide if the privacy policy and the filtering agrees with what they want to do. And then add that DNS server to their list of approved DNS servers that is then used in selection. Next slide, please. All I have. Any questions? Oh, we do. Uh, Jim Reed, please. Thanks once again, I'm again speaking in Scottish. Um, how would these privacy authentication tokens be handled with vanilla DNS where you're not using a dot or DH? Uh, would you expect that the data is going to be DNS side? I believe we could get them sent down uh, because the, the signature is outside, you know, the signature doesn't rely on a secure channel. So we could get them sent down. Um, the difficulty is the subsequent queries for class, you know, DNS over 53 um, could be interfered with by someone on path. So we lose the, it opens up different attack vectors or, or wider attack vectors. That's what initially comes to mind. Okay, thanks. Yep. Thank you. John Todd, please. A sound check. You. Okay, great. Uh, so the additional complexity of a push seems um, optimistic. Um, was there a reason that something as simple as a TTL wasn't considered? Um, no, we just thought the push was kind of nice. Um, I agree that the push is, is kind of risky. The device could be asleep, uh, all sorts of other issues with it not being able to see that push. Um, certainly, we expect each time that uh, connection to the server occurs, you know, when you join the network, that this information would be retrieved. Um, but yeah, TTL um, seems like a, a nice way to solve that too. Thank you. Thank you. Allison Mankin, please. Hi. Um, I just wanted to mention, since it's in the, the references, but you didn't specifically say it, that there's guidance on creating a, a privacy server policy in the deprive um, server uh, privacy server BCP draft that is uh, with the IASG now. So there's actually specific ex examples of how you might write one for both dot and do. Thank you. Okay, and we've run the queue, so back to you, Glenn. All right then. I'll remove it along nicely to our next presentation. And our last presentation, Daniel, are you on? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can. So, next slide. So, the DNS Resolver Discovery Protocol. Next slide. So, basically, the motivation is that um, a DNS. I mean, DNS resolving service can be achieved um, using different uh, resolvers, so different identities, um, and over uh, multiple transports. And each of those resolving servers may also provide some different um, services, like filtering and so on. So if we want to perform a selection, we need to know um, which are those um, resolver, uh, resolving services that are available. And um, the purpose of this um, DNS resolver discovery protocol is to enable a client to discover all the available resolvers, um, I mean resolving services, so with transport and so on, but also a resolver to also inform um, a DNS client that um, maybe a preferred or some alternative resolving service are also available. Next slide. So I, I had set a, a various requirements just to make sure um, I, well, we agree on what the discovery protocol is. And um, so I'm going to go briefly through all these requirements before um, exposing the solution. Uh, so the protocol needs to 
um, may be used by a DNS client, and that DNS client may be using the uh, regular DNS or the DOT or DO, and discover the various resolving uh, services, as well as um, uh, resolving services may use this protocol also to um, to advertise a DNS client. Some other uh, resolving services are available. That's my first requirement. The second one is that um, yeah, I mean the protocol must be able. I mean the discovery should be dynamic and concern local and global resolvers. And um, yeah, and uh, the parameters must be at least the transport parameters, but that may also be extended in the future. Um, just to mention that, um, I mean, it could be extended um, with what is being described in the, in the document. Um, then it's, um, I mean, discovery is one nice thing, but we would like um, the output of this discovery to be used um, carefully by the DNS client. So the draft is not discussing that at all, how the selection process is operating, but um, we do, I mean, um, the discovery mechanism should be made so that um, the selection process can be automated, involve the DNS client, as well as maybe the other party, which is the resolving service. So, um, in, or, in order to ease the automation, we would like um, the output to, to be provided in a very standard way. Um, so, next slide. And because, I mean, um, the configuration and the selection can also involve the end user, um, we would like that um, the output could also um, be presented to the end user and so be understood by that end user, as well as requirement six, which is maybe the end user just want to uh, be involved into a subset of those um, uh, output um, provided by the resolver discovery uh, protocol. So um, at some point, um, he might be able to delegate that to the um, resolving service to choose what um, the best option. Um, then I, another um, requirement is um, if you know you want to look only for resolving services that belongs to one category uh, instead of the other, uh, maybe you should be able to narrow down the discovery so to a subset of uh, resolving services. In this document, I'm considering the DO dot and uh, um, DO uh, 53. Um, yeah, the, the um, information provided by the uh, the protocol should be um, authenticated, and um, I mean the protocol should not disrupt the legacy protocols and uh, sh should be also be integrated by the the currently used uh, DNS clients. So these are the requirements I used. Next slide. So I suppose we keep the question for the end unless someone is willing to jump. Um, raise some questions. So the information returned by the, the discovery protocol. So, I mean, I'm, I think one of, one of the important uh, parameters, discovery parameters is the, the identity of the resolver. So um, how can we represent the resolver? So I'm basically thinking that we can use a host name and a resolving domain. So the resolving domain in this example, if we have hostname.example.com, would be example.com. Um, it, 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 it's close to an identity because it's quite meaningful to the end user. It's close to the legal entity in some cases, um, though it's not user friendly, but it could be used as a key to, um, to retrieve uh, uh, um, information that you, I mean, um, you would like to present to the end user in some case. And uh, we believe um, that if um, the end user has to select a resolver, it needs to be, it needs to have some familiarity with the, the DNS um, DNS names. So we believe it's it's pretty fine. Um, host name, on the other hand, um, we don't believe it's um, it's it's um, it's a so meaningful information, and we don't expect it to be uh, presented um, to the end user. And then. For an identity associated to this, that, that identity, we have a resolver parameters. 
which concern the transport, the TLS, URI templates, specific services like filtering and so on. So on the, um, domain names that are also authoritative and, uh, and so on and so on. So next slide. So at a high level view, we have a resolving domain, like uh, example.com, and um, under that domain, you all the the flavor of the resolving service are, are found, and um, the protocol is basically using DNS message to um, discover all those um, uh, parameters. Next slide. DNS being the language between, I mean, understood by the DNS client as well as by the resolver. Um, so. Um, when the discovery protocol is performed by the client, the first thing is to discover the resolving domains, local and uh, global, and um, then discover the, the various flavors of the resolver within that uh, resolving domain. When performed by the resolver, I mean, it's like a push, um, it should send this information back um, during a, a DNS exchange, for example. Next slide. So, to discover uh, the global um, domain, well, using a similar idea than um, um, than the DNSSD, we're using a browsing domain and a special domain which would be dns.rdns.rpa, and this specific domain name is going to list all the globally available resolver, um, not the resolver. But the the resolving domains, um, and then for the local domain, the lo local resolver, and usually you've been provided an IP address through a DHCP or Rudo advertisement. So you simply do a reverse um, DNS resolution to that IP address, and you find hostname dot um, resolving domain, and that domain should be the one uh, associated to the resolver. So, if you want to discover all the different flavors under a resolving domain, so in this case, the, um, the domain is example.com, so you want to discover the DNS service, so you, 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 you add the underscore dns.example.com, and you do an SVCB um, request, so you have the interactions to um, all the different flavors, so here, um, we mentioned the legacy resolver, uh, the prefer example choice, um, and um, the others um, uh, flavors using uh, dope, for example. Um, so that's basically one way to do. Um, then, if we want to uh, make um, the discovery among a subset of those resolvers, so um, only, for example, those implementing dope or dot, for example, we can go to next slide. And so the first thing is that a PTR, um, uh, PTR request will list you the different uh, sub subservices, subset of um, um, resolving services. So in this example, we have uh, um, do53 uh, uh, dot and do, and then I mean you. I mean, uh, the, the answer provided by the PTTR, you can do uh, the discovery among this subset of resolvers. Um, so you can see, well, I mean, the only difference is that in one time you have a, like a service subtype, which is indicated by the port, the standard port of each of those um, resolving services. And then um, you you have um, the S, um, SVC parameter keys and uh, SVC parameters values that you need. Um, I mean, that's going to be useful for um, the selection. So some of those um, SVC keys I thought of were um, so the URI templates, um, a user interface a string. Um, uh, names the resolver is also authoritative for, and uh, maybe uh, names that have a private view on that. So all this kind of information could, could be added uh, um, into those strings. So next. 
Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, ben Schwartz, please. Who might once again be having microphone problems. Puneet, how's your microphone doing? Hi, this is Puneet here. Can you hear me? Hi, Daniel. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, the question, and it may tie in with like the resolver info draft, which Paul and I wrote. But the one thing I do not understand here, uh, maybe I'm missing something, is how is the list of resolvers generated and who is responding to the queries with this information to the client? So, um... I mean, you're, um, can you repeat the question? I, I mean, we had a burst. Sure. So one question one, who is generating the list of available resolvers here? And question two, on the, when the client is getting the response, which entity or where is the server which is generating this response to the client with the list of resolver names? So, uh, so for the first um, um, for the first question, um, you we if we think of a, a special domain name like rdns.rpa, um, of course, um, let's say Google will have to register and uh, ask for um, his domain name to be uh, pointed at that level. So, is that part of the is that the question? Okay, yeah, that clarifies uh, your intent. Okay. So that's in, um, I'm trying to find out. Yeah, on slide eight, for example, again. I think uh, Glenn is pulling that up. I'm working on it. So this is a tail relaying a question from okay. Ben Schwartz. Okay, so can you tell me which slide you want because they're not numbered. So at uh, this, uh, uh, it's, uh, I don't know who is going to take care of that, but it could be the, I mean, the IANA, for example, and um, um, I mean, uh, globally available services would be represented by resolving domains. So um, you could have um, um, one dot one dot one. You have uh, Google dot com, or I mean, all those domains. Um, so that's that was the intention. Okay, Puneet. Yeah, and I think also the second question. So the second question is um, who is um, um, publishing the information? I mean, the in next slide. Is that the second question? Who's publishing this information? Yes. So, um, if if the um, I mean if um, um, I mean it's the 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 person responsible for um, example.com. No, I'm so, sorry. So the oh. question was who's pub responding or responding with the message which contains the list of servers to the client. So you mean, um, I mean, is the question, is the svc.example.com the same as um, example.com? No, no. So my question is, so we'll have a list populated under uh, resinfo.rpa. Okay. And who's returning that list? Is the, you envision a new operator there or? I expected something uh, shared by the operators, so like uh, IANA. Okay. Uh, like the root servers. You guys want to take this offline, Neat? Yeah, I'll take that offline. Okay. okay. Thank you. 
Um, relaying from Jabber for Ben Schwartz, uh, he observes that the public DNS server list has 11,000 resolvers on it. Uh, do you propose to publish them all? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, the, I mean, uh, I don't know what would be the the criteria to be entered into that, but um, yeah. Uh, one thing is that I guess that the public DNS got a whitelist, um, so there's probably I don't expect to end up with um, eleven thousand. Um, I expect only to have the publicly available resolver, so I don't know if there are 11,000 publicly globally available uh, resolver. Okay, uh, thank you. We have uh, two more in the mic line for this uh, before we throw it back to Glenn for the wrap up today. Um, and I apologize if I am mispronouncing your name, but I see Rayhan Joe Ferrali. Maybe best if you say your name when you get on the mic. Okay, uh, not hearing anything there. So let's move on to uh, Harold Alpstrand. Hi, Harold Alpstrand here. Uh, just a comment on uh, having a global list of servers. If you define a business idea where someone has a mono monopoly on deciding who gets to play and who's not, you're asking for a lot of trouble. We have enough trouble with the root servers. We shouldn't ask for another list like that. So, um, yeah, uh, sorry. Um, it's, um, I think the, uh, the, the, the point is uh, on who is able to decide who can come in and not be in. Um, I, I think this list is going to exist anyway. So, um, as long as it's, it's open and uh, the process of integrating that list. Um, I think it's solvable. I do understand the risk and it should be considered. Yeah. Thank you for the comment. Uh, you might also want to consider what the CA, CA browser consortium has to go through with uh, validating CAs. It's kind of the same kind of thing. Uh, thank you, and Rehan is going to follow up with you offline. Uh, so we will now throw it back to Glenn. Okay, so thank you everyone for the comments, and I'm happy to take that um, offline or to continue. So thank you. Uh, so there's a picture of our our, our audience <laughs> for today. Um, so we have 12 minutes left. Um, I would invite people to either either the job or someplace else to you know give comments on how they thought this ran, um, and what worked and what where things can improve. Because we have a bunch of other uh, groups that are going to meet later this week that can learn from our experience, being one of the first ones to try this. Um, so the intention in the next couple of minutes is basically if people have uh, some Q and A um, that they would like to ask of the chairs or of the of the group in general, the ADs uh, about about where the ADD group is going or what the next steps are, um, this is your opportunity. Of course, you can always do it in the list. Okay, and uh, Martin Thompson, right up to the mic, please. So one of the things I saw in the presentations that we had were, was a lot of concentration on the specifics of discovery mechanisms without a great deal of uh, discussion about what it is that the the uh, the requirements are and, and I guess the principles that are driving that. I think Dan got into some of that with his presentation, but um, I would like to see us talk a little bit more about 
what we thought the principles were. We saw Tommy with one approach, we saw Daniel and Dan with different approaches to, to discovery. I'd really like to, to say, well, are we talking about networks providing this information or are we talking about something else? Because um, obviously Tommy's going in a different direction. Uh, all right, I'll pass. Uh, thank you. Paul Hoffman, please. Uh, I, this is Paul Hoffman. So I was about to say something very similar to what Martin just said. Um, one of the things that drove the creation of this working group was the question of simply how do I discover whether I can upgrade from um, unencrypted DNS to encrypted DNS? Um, and I hadn't seen that in any of the presentations today. I would be interested to know if the working group still finds that to be um, useful, um, because I would think that that would be easier than almost any of the other proposals. Thanks. And thank you, Paul. Simon Hicks, please. My question is sort of um, from how is it all actually going to work? Um, we're looking here at uh, um, the detail, but what about the sort of um, the users? Um, what's their wrap going to be? When are we going to talk about that? So Simon, I think your initial comments got cut off. Could you could you start where you started off again? <laughs> Sorry. So yeah, um, yeah. I was asking um, for um, where are we going to talk about this from a user perspective, um, rather than um, the detail of implementation. Um, still seem to be sort of lacking uh, the ability to make user choice here. Um, not speaking for the entire rest of the working group, but personally, I anticipated being brought up in um, kind of pervasively throughout. Um, you know, I'm not again, no hat. This is a tale, by the way, uh, David Lawrence. So no hat on. I'm not, you know, setting direction here. Um, but this seems to me to be something that is a kind of pervasive consideration that rather than standing on its own in a, you know, a separate uh, document has to be kind of brought up in in each of the contexts that we're talking about uh chris box please hi yeah um i just want to agree with what martin thompson said yeah i i think we do need to discuss requirements and principles first um it's just tricky to get agreement on that but yeah let's let's start it in some form At the moment, if anybody else would uh, like to put in some comments, maybe Jim revisit his from the uh, beginning of the meeting. Otherwise, we are actually not only going to end on time, but slightly early. Okay, I'll jump in just for a quick moment um, to go back to the document from Ted and Yari, the status of the agenda. We need to look at what that impact is going to be on enterprise networks. And maybe if the document will somebody have to say something like spreading the query load or the query traffic across a bunch of different servers is something that's all that going to go down there on the enterprise nets. Uh, Andrew Kamplin, please. Uh, yeah, just. Uh, um... Going back to, to, I think it was uh, Simon's point about the user, uh, the voice of the user in this, um, and maybe making it slightly complex uh, that the user might be the uh, enterprise network administrator or indeed the parent. Uh, I think some of the, the discussions touched on that briefly, but uh, I think we, mean, we need to make sure that this isn't just a slick set of options for clients. 
um, that completely bypass the uh, user of, of the uh, device um, and assume that the uh, client is all knowing and all seeing in, in this. So we need to make sure that the user is included and it might not be literally the end user of the device. It, may, it might be a, another entity that, uh, such as the, the enterprise admin. So Dave, is it a wrap? Yeah, I tried to pass it back to you in our side chat. <laughs> you uh, you are the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you Literally are. We just came through. So, hey, thank you everybody for doing this. I think it went pretty well. Uh, I was worried uh, first time we tried this. So uh, we peaked out a little over 200 participants. Um, we had that one glitch with uh, uh, somehow preview wouldn't advance to the next slide while when it was being shared. Uh, but restarting preview solved that problem. So thank you for your patience. And uh, I'll see the rest of you guys on the list. Thank you very much. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. You all. Bye.